Well, I guess my first question is, uh, is it just Mexico City in November, or are you guys going to add more? There's two. Yeah, the two Mexico shows, right? Yeah, Mexico City with Amon Marth, and Guadalajara with somebody else. Because that seems to be the conflict that started the big brouhaha with the whole Death Angel business. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not my band. <laughs> right, right. I mean, I everybody's got an opinion on it, and I figured I would have to ask you. I think it might be the Australian one. Because the Australian the one's Australian beginning one in December. Okay. Oh, okay. So there's three, there's a three, like multiple conflicting dates. Oh, yeah. Mexico, Australia, etc. Mm. Okay. Um, is that the kind of thing that you expected to come up suddenly, or... Did it just opportunity presented and here we are, like the That's Slayer? Pretty reunion. much here it is. Well, right? yeah, that that came up. You know, that was shot down for years and years and years, and you know, finally it's like okay, you know, we can. Once I figured out how to spin it, because you know, I I was always like one that said, you know, we retired, but at the end of the day, we retired from touring. We're not going to tour anymore. So. Um, my take on it is there's three shows celebrating the five-year anniversary of our last tour. I think it's fair. You, you guys did say, I remember you saying specifically in press, like, we might, we might do some festivals or something here and there, but there's no more band, no more new album, no more touring. No album. Where no, are the chains? I'm, I'm very, they're sitting in the same shitty bag they were in when they were on tour. <laughs> oh, they probably smell awful. No, they don't smell, it's metal. No. They don't smell like anything. Oh. Oh, the bag um, probably smells awful. Maybe. Um, are you, Bring in the bag? I mean, is it going to no. be a full... No? No, I retired the chains. So this is a chainless commemoration? The, the chain drop. I, I'm not going to be a hypocrite and do that. May I make something different? I might make something different, but I'm not wearing those. Could the chains maybe be part of like a charity auction someday or something interesting like that? Or a museum exhibit? You know, I'm, I'm, I was quite surprised at the hard rock or the rocker or the... the Rock and Roll Museum Hall of Fame in Cleveland didn't hit me up for any of that stuff. I was kind of blown away. So cool, I still have it. Well, I think we can all just assume that the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame just doesn't know enough about metal to know that they want They've them. got a little big four section that the only band not super hugely represented is us. And you were the first to retire. Yeah. Of the big four. I did not see that coming. I didn't either. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the new album from Hell I Rise is awesome, but you already knew that. And when you played, I was super lucky. I got to hear the rough mixes at your oh, house yeah, yeah. in 22. And it's way better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's way I better. I had a feeling it, it would be. In. I mean, you did caveat that this, these are rough mixes. Um, and I think some of them didn't have vocals yet, and some of Could them had, had your vocals. And then when I heard the album, I noticed that Mark um, kind of kept to that same range that you were in. Mm -hmm. And I know Mark has a lot of range to go through. And I didn't know if that was intentional. Like, did you want to keep it that tone? Or did you not want Mark to be singing any kind of like clean vocals or power vocals or? I definitely didn't want clean vocals. Mm -hmm. This music, well, these particular, this family of songs, so to speak, doesn't have room for any clean vocals. It's all too aggro. Um, and you know, I did. I wanted it to be aggressive and represent what the songs were trying to bark out and they're written in a way that you know it's just got to be angry and what I wanted to do and we worked on probably because he, he did demos with us probably I don't even know probably 10 12 months off and on come down every five six weeks when he was free and he would come down and better songs he had done or sing new ones that he hadn't sung yet um, you know and I just instilled in his brain I said I don't want Death Angel Mark and that's nothing against Death Angel I got no beef with him at all but I said You've got to become something that, that is going to be you for from now till you end singing. It's like you got to become this dude that people are going to say, I did not expect that out of him. I didn't expect it out of him. Um, and where we ended up, you know, I was very, very happy and very proud of his performance. When he started singing, um, the range, 
he was singing in for the demos is completely different than he did on the album. You know, and I we didn't talk about it. He just came in and showed up and went for it. You know, and it was the second song he did. I think it was um, Residue. And Josh Wilbur, the producer, I was in another room doing something, came in and get me and said, I think you should listen to this. And we got through like the first verse and chorus. I said, how did you end up at this register? He's like, well, that's where Mark felt comfortable singing it. And I went, I immediately went to Mark and I said, hey, is this reproducible or are you going to, you know, sing two shows and be out for the next three? And so far, so good. You know, he told me then he could do it. And, you know, I know, I've known Mark for decades, but I don't know Mark like that mm -hmm. at that point. So, you know, an hour later, I went and asked him again <laughs> just to see, see if anything changed. And he, he made me a believer, so that's what we kept, and it just kept getting crazier from there. And so far, you guys are a good few shows in. Mm -hmm. He's holding up. Oh, God, he sounds great. I knew he would. You know, when um, I was one of the few people that knew that he was in the band, so whenever we were around each other, he had, like, that moment of, like, you know. <laughs> it was just this, like, crazy sense of relief and excitement that would just hit him. And at the it was last, tough on those guys. It was really hard. I mean, it's tough on me, but at least I could say I was in the band, you know. But the other guys, you know, we kept a good, good lid on it. It was hard on me, and I had nothing to do with the band. People just knew that I knew, and were trying to get it out of me, and I was like, I said I wouldn't say anything. Yeah, it was definitely by far the best kept secret in metal, if not music, completely. But Mark has been. Not only is he really strong in the vocals but he was so confident that the last death angel show um he was just blasting it out there and he would look up at me in the balcony and just like hold a note for an insanely long period of time he does some stuff now you know he's, and then and then just look up and wink he does that <laughs> he does he does that that thing i like about front men singers when you know they come to a live situation and they tweak their performance a bit you know, and make it a little different, make it a little bit more edgy for the live crowd. And when I watch, you know, I watch some stuff on YouTube and stuff. Um, I'm like, I had no idea he was doing that. I have him a little bit in my monitors, not a lot, but I didn't notice some of the things he was doing. And yeah, he's he's holding some notes. So that's what I was wondering is, are the songs evolving? Because they were created in such isolation. Even when you guys were working together, you really didn't get a chance to work together on the music. Now that you guys are together for a lot of shows, has there been any kind of evolution or thought to changing anything up? Never really occurred to me. You know, it's just, for us, it's figuring out where to be and when to be there on stage. <laughs> and, and, you know, the beginning of this tour, we we're still figuring that out. But now I think we've got, I think I got all my light cues down now. Um, and I think we all know where to be and not in danger of getting hit by a stray guitar head or something. So how long do you feel like it took from like first rehearsals of playing together to actually just firing on all cylinders and feeling we've, comfortable? We've had some, you know, in Europe we had some, but it was still, it was still gelling. You know, it took a long time. Um, it's, it's not like riding a bike like I thought it was going to be for me anyway. Um, but like Hellfest was super rad in Europe Mystic in Poland was killer. Tuska in um, Finland. Finland? I think it was Finland. They were killer shows. Um, you know, and then you'd have ones to where you're like, ah, I missed this part. Or When we first started doing this, I hadn't played with pedals in so long. I'd be daydreaming over on stage right somewhere and go, motherfucker, there's no way I'm going to get back to that fucking pedal over there. It's just not going to happen. <laughs> um, you know, just, just getting that mindset and, mm -hmm. and getting that bike feel back took a long time but when it finally gelled for me and, and stopped having to think about stuff was around Montreal on this tour Montreal's a really killer show and we've had pretty much really killer shows since so I think I think the learning curves come and went how far out are you sketched with the solo band now because I think because of the pandemic, having absolutely nothing for so long, it gave you so much time to write music, come up with plans, come up with ideas. It sounds like, from what I'm hearing in other interviews, you're already like on the third album in your head. I've got, you know, I don't have the, the second album mapped out. 
I got plenty of material for it, you know. Um, I don't know if everything I've written is what's going to be on album two, or if there's something I've yet to write that might still be on album two. Um, but there'll be plenty of downtime in between tours to to work on that. Plenty of songs. Me and Paul have demoed probably ten or twelve songs between now in the recording of Repentless because I still got stuff from that I still got stuff from, from Hell I Rise and I've got stuff I've written since then so there's a, a multitude of stuff that's just kind of you know waiting around until we get off of this US run for me to readdress and I want to whenever tour one album cycles tour album one album cycles over Paul and I are, are determined to go in within a week or two and just get like you know, live performance. So we don't have to relearn and re-up our chops. We'll be coming off tour, we'll be sharp, you know, rehearse those songs for a couple of weeks and hopefully get right in and record record two, whatever that is. So at this point, you've got this tour, um, Mexico, Australia. Is there anything on the books or tentatively on the books for next year touring? Yep. Anything you can say? No. Yeah. Uh, can you say if it's headline or a package? Uh, the only thing I know right now is headline. Okay. So, what size venues are you looking at? I think it's um, 1,000 to 1,500. Yeah. Because um, they want it to be an event. They want to sell out. They want people not to be able to get tickets. So, it becomes such a, a, a thing that, you know, everybody's like, they need to come back, they need to come back, you know. And hopefully then we come back and play, you know, 25, 3,000 maybe. Are there things that you realize are now possible to do with this band that were kind of unrealistic when you were in Slayer? Like what? And now you've got an opportunity to play some historic theaters that Slayer didn't play? Or... Oh, you mean size-wise? Yeah, well, venues or, I don't know, anything that but yeah, but happens we might have hit, we might have hit those, with the band. We might have hit those places coming up. So, it, it might, it's been a while, but I mean, I'm sure I'm going to come into a lot of these places and say, I remember this place. You know, yeah. I'm going to ask about the Fillmore, because I don't think Slayer played the Fillmore in San Francisco, did you? I don't know. I know the Warfield was a big thing for a while. Mm -hmm. I remember the Warfield. Uh, I know you played the Stone and um, Mountain View Theater and a lot of different places around the Bay, but I don't think you played the Fillmore. Yeah. I'm just saying on that. Course. Four decades of gigs. I, I can't remember all of them. <laughs> I haven't even been to that many, and I can't remember all of them. Um... The songs, everybody seems to be really excited about the fact that you sang the songs before Mark did. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I think that that's the novelty of people not realizing you could sing. And I feel like your vocals are kind of like the Gene Simmons level. You know, they're great. I'm like, you I actually, hope that's good. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, like, uh, Gene uh, Simmons had a ton of hits with Kiss. I mean, he's a good singer. He can sing. I think that Kiss just evolved into the greater range and different registers that Paul Stanley had. But I feel like, and I think I told you this before when I first heard the songs, that you could totally sing some songs if you wanted to. Like if you wanted, like if Mark was taking a break or if people wanted to, you know, for whatever reason you guys wanted to change up the set, have you thought about singing one of the less complicated guitar songs? I can't. No. I could probably... I would say I could probably get by doing two fists, but then there's the the riff in the middle that doesn't really have a lot of vocals on it, but the riff right before it does, and I couldn't sing over that. Yeah, I can. When you see me singing live, it's because the riff's so easy, I don't got to think about it. <laughs> um, when it so. comes to um, people clamoring to hear it, do you think it's something that you guys might just drop on the internet for fun, or maybe do like a record store day? It, might, release it might show up somewhere, yeah. you know, Mark, Mark's not worried about it. He doesn't feel threatened by me doing no. it. Um, so, you know, it, I, I know like when I was younger and I know Tipton did a record and I know Tipton did some singing on it. Of course I was intrigued. He's one of my favorite guitar players. So um, I can see people would be into it. So it wouldn't surprise me if it ends up somewhere. I think people are just super curious. I, uh, yeah, for sure. I, you know? I was totally shocked to find out you sang it just didn't dawn on me right, right. like yeah, yeah I'm an angry not, little fucker you're sneaky um cause you're not on, you're not singing anywhere else right have you sang on a project that I missed I sang I did Slayer scratch vocals for years 
but nothing that the average person, the average fan would have heard. No. Yeah. It's all, no, no. it's all like under the radar stuff. Um, you changed guitars from D to Dean now, right? Yeah, I got with Dean just at the tail end of the Slayer run. What was the caveat for changing up? Well, I mean, anybody that knows me, and even if you don't know me, you know I don't hop between companies very often, if at all. Um, but, you know, BC Rich ran its course. Um, they owed me money for a long, long time. And I, I, I always knew pulling the trigger on moving means I'm never going to see that money. So I waited, waited, waited. And I'm like, all right, Slayer's wrapping up now, I know. So my new company, I want to give them a little bit of heat. So, you know, it's worth their while to take me on. Um, you know, not just waiting for my solo thing, but, um, you know, get some Slayer heat. So, like, mid-year, 19, I got with those guys. Um, you know, and if, if things were different with BC Rich, I would never leave, you know. I, went, I was with them two different times. Um, and I'm very loyal to whoever I'm endorsing, you know. I've been with Marshall since, I think, the dawn of time. Um, so, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll be with Dean till the end of time, until whatever point that becomes, that it's not worth it for me or them. I mean, they're my family. The BC Rich guys are my family, but, you know, sooner or later it becomes a business decision. Business decision. Was it a buyout that preceded that with them, or was it just something internal that ended up... No, they stopped paying me. <laughs> oh, that, just, that was it. It was like, and no check. Okay. Um, when you guys were coming up, I remember talking... Not coming up, sorry. When, when you first knew that Slayer was ending and you were moving on, I remember talking to you at Comic-Con, and I remember pushing Phil Anselmo as an option, and you were like, no. And I was like, well, I could see where it would make sense, and you were like, I could see where it would make sense, but just no. And for some reason, everyone was just convinced he was going to be in the band. It was like the most prevalent rumor, and I'm wondering what fueled that, because you never told anybody that you were considering Phil for the band. Phil never said, I want to be in Carrie's band, like, but it just was out there and everywhere. Um, you know, without knowing any of the interior stuff, business-wise, it just makes sense. You know, I've known Phil since before Cowboys from Hell. You know, I'm, I don't know a lot of people that known him that long. Um, you know, and he was coming off, off our opening spot on our tour. You know, you don't have to think very hard to see how that could have happened. Um, but, you know, the record I made up isn't conducive to a good ensemble performance. You know, there's too much fast stuff going on. He's gotten, he's gotten slower over the years. All the down stuff, super slow. Um, yeah, he's been in a thousand other bands too, but, um, you know, business-wise, all the suits wanted it to happen. My manager, my record company, my booking agent, everyone, because, you know, immediately you're doing arenas. Um, and at the end of the day, um, the Pantera thing came up, and I just said, well, yeah, whatever, go do that. So what... We talked of... about it off and on. Yeah. But he never rehearsed with us. He never came to a rehearsal. He never did vocals on anything. Did he hear any of the music? He's heard a bit. Before you decided on Mark? Yeah, Mark got the gig. Mark didn't get the gig till April, April, February last year, February 23. Even though he'd been working with us for a better part of a year, I think. Um, I finally just came down and said, you know, I don't need to drag my feet anymore. I was dragging my feet because... I didn't have to make a decision immediately. You know, I wasn't immediately going to record, but by February, we were recording in two months, and Mark was killing it, you know? And I just said, there's no point in me not giving you this gig. So I, he was in my backyard in Vegas, and I told him we had a shot of tequila and went to the Pro Bowl. So you kind of have a super group, but you kind of don't want it to be a super group because this is just your new band. People are going to call it that because you got people from five different bands of different levels of success. Um, but yeah, this this is my band, and this is how I want to retire from music with these guys. And with a solid half of your band being from the Bay Area thrash scene, and you being from the beginnings of thrash, um, was that intentional or? 
did you just happen to pick the players that you felt worked best with you personally and professionally and musically and it just happened to be half the band is from the Bay Area yeah it just happened <laughs> really you know my prerequisite more than anything was to just get friends because mm-hmm. um, this point in my life my career my age I'm like I don't need any drama I don't need any any you know diva scenario situations I just want to I want to play with dudes, and when we're done, like in like like at the end of the show, we all get in the middle of the stage and, and do a shot to the crowd and throw out our cups, and um, you know then we go backstage and we just chill. You know, it's it's not like somebody's segregated over here, somebody's segregated over here. We're all doing you know just bro stuff. Define bro stuff. You know, hanging out and not having anybody worry about what they say to somebody else or not tippy toe around any situation not like walk like eggshells like walk on eggshells around anybody it's just everybody's down with it having a good try oh, I can't even speak having a good time it's been a long fucking couple days um, honestly it's been a long few months I, <laughs> I was like oh let me see what what questions Carrie's already answered and I watched a bunch of interviews and I was like Jesus Christ how are you doing this I yeah. told him, I was like, can we get Carrie some tea? Because every interview I see, you have like a little bit of a cough. And I think it's because you're just doing so much practice. Well, usually when I, yeah, usually when I do them, there's like at least four. Mm-hmm. So. That's a lot. Yeah, it's just a cool situation with five dudes who have known each other. I mean, Kyle's the one I've known the least amount of time. I met him in 2015. But everybody else I've known for decades. And of course they can play their instruments. Of course Mark can sing like a motherfucker, but... You know, these are all my bros, and we're enjoying ourselves for, you know, the first time for some of us, some of us in years. For what you remember back in the beginnings of Thrash, you guys were in L.A., the rest of the guys were in San Francisco, and it seemed like I-5 was a lot shorter back then, and you guys were in San Francisco a lot. Did you ever consider relocating up there, just like Metallica did? Never did. Not once? Not for any reason. Like, I like the Bay Area. Um, it, It just wasn't for me. At the time, did you feel like you were playing a different kind of metal than everybody else was? No, because Metallica was more of a thrash band back then. Um, everybody was, really. Megadeth was thrashier. Um, and then, obviously, Metallica went on a much more poppy trail than we did. Um, they came back around, you know. Um, they've had a couple pretty killer records, the last couple. Um, and I get confused which one's called what but the one with spit out the bone i love spit out the bone killer fucking song um but you know as as we matured and you know went our separate paths we pretty much stayed the thrashiest of the big four i would say by any means um that didn't make us better or anything we're just different like the ramones of thrash fair enough what uh what was the catalyst? Was there a catalyst event when you were a kid that kind of brought you into metal? Was there like somebody handed you an album or? It's probably hearing um, Priest on the radio because we had two rock stations back then before KNEC. Um, and I, I heard probably Breaking the Law or Living After Midnight. It was something on British Steel. Mm-hmm. And um, I didn't know who Judas Priest was, believe it or not at that point in my life and I'm like cool I like the singer I like there's two guitars um, so then what you did back then you would go buy all the old records and that's when I found Hellbent for Leather and Stained Class and Sad Wings and all that stuff and you're like where have I been you know um, and then the first time I was able to see Priest was on uh, the next one fucking The Desert Plains is on I can't even think of what it's called um, was it? Point of Entry. See, I knew that. Point of Entry. And when I went and saw him, you know, the whole time before this, Halford's in his his uh, it's leather and studs and everything, and that fucking tour, he shows up in a fucking jean sweatsito, <laughs> jean jacket and, <laughs> and jean fucking leather, uh, uh, denim jeans. I'm like, who's this guy? Come on. Uh, it was just a letdown for me from all the photos you've seen back then, which would have been magazines. Mm-hmm. Um but, you know, it's Priest. It was killer. And he's my favorite singer since the dawn of time. He's always my number one. That's tough to say, being a friend of Ronnie James Dio. But Dio's always been my number two, man. Sorry, bro. What kind of kid were you before that happened? I mean, were you just... I mean, were, were we talking about 
you at like 15, 16, 17, or are we talking about well, you at like 10, 11, 12? When did British Steel come out? 80? 80? I think so. I would have been 16. Um, DJ Will from KNAC often being our historian in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> you know everything. We could ask you anything right now and you would know the answer. So I would have been 16. So yeah, I was getting what I listened to from you know, those two other radio stations we had back then. Um, and that was kind of Priest's first shot at radio play because they're, mm -hmm. you know, catchy, you know, short single type songs that will get on the radio. So that's that was my introduction. And then, you know, after that, you know, I found Maiden. Uh, even though Sabbath was around, I wasn't really, didn't know much about it. Went, you know, I went and did my metal homework and figured out more about what I wanted to do and how I wanted to do it. So, I think at this point, you might be the third most hated man in metal. Oh, man, I thought it was all right. I know. I mean, I figure Lars Ulrich is always number one. <laughs> right? He's the guy everybody loves to hate. I love Lars. And then, I usually put Dave Mustaine in number two, but I think lately, with you guys having the audacity to bring Slayer back, and, you know, and you having a solo band, God forbid, um... I think you're like now the third, maybe even the second most hated man in metal. I'll have to work my way around that. <laughs> if, uh, I mean, and I know you're not on social media, but you still, you hear a lot of things. What is something you've heard that you thought was fair? Oh, okay. Somebody was talking shit, but you know what? That, there's something to that. I really don't have anything I can mention because I don't have, I still don't have anything. But you've I never, just have what my friends tell me. Yeah. You've never heard anything where you were like, okay, maybe that. No? Not really. You're fucking perfect. You know, I know the, I know, you know, and the internet's full of people that just get on to say hateful stuff, whether they know anything about it or not. And I don't need any of that. So it's all Bo just bothering my day. You know? It's just troll culture. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Fair enough. It's not like you're going to sue your fans or anything. Um, I, we are almost done. I can't believe we're like blasting through all this. You're so practiced at the at the interviews now. Um. Oh, I know what I want to ask you. Um, so many days ago, back when um, we were at a Nam convention, and Lombardo was in the band again, and I remember you said to me, "Bo Staff doesn't get a third time to quit my fucking band." And I was like, I promise you, Paul doesn't want to quit your band ever again. And I was just predicting that Lombardo was going to eventually be Implode. gone. And, <laughs> and, you know, and I was like, at that point, you know, it's probably going to be a last minute thing. And the question's going to be, Deddy or Bostaff? And I was like, I'm team Bostaff all the way. And years go by. And I know you have no memory of that conversation, I'm sure. But it ended up happening that way. And I just wondered... How has your relationship with Bo Staff evolved over the years from, you know, bringing him into Slayer, him leaving, him coming back, him leaving, him coming back, him staying with you and being, can I say, the anchor to your new band? Well, you know, if I had my choice, I would have never have him left the band any time. Um, and the second time he, we parted ways... I, I did say exactly what you said to me. I don't remember saying it to you, but you know, I'm always like, um, why would I have somebody that's quit my band twice come back? Um, and when that conversation happened, that's when we're on a flight to Australia. That Dave, you know, we fired him like two days before. Luckily, Denny was in Anthrax, and I called Scott personally. I said, "Hey, man, do you mind if he learns eight or nine songs of ours so we can play?" And we were able to do that. Um, but like, like I landed and I had no idea that that shit had happened. And I'm like, my phone's blowing up when I get to Australia and, and Bo Staff's like two of the calls. I'm like, what happened while I was on that flight? <laughs> and, and that's when Dave did his interview, like putting out all kinds of dirty laundry that, you know, it's nobody's business. It's, it, you shouldn't put fans in a situation where they have to make a choice. That's just fucked up. Journey. Um, Sorry. And. You know, I said the same thing to myself when I actually called him because Paul's been my friend throughout the whole thing. Leaving, coming, whatever. 
Um, like the first time he told me he was going to lead the band, I said, all right, so we got our business done. Are we going to the bar now? <laughs> Let's go hang. Um, but I told him, I said, um, you know, why would I have you in my band so you can quit a third time? And he assured me to the extent that I'm like, I believe you. All right. I'm either super gullible or, you know, whatever. But, you know, or third time's a charm. Yeah, hopefully third time's a charm because he's still here. How's your relationship now compared to how it was before? Are you guys on more equal footing or do you rely on him more or is, has there well, been any band, change at all? In this band, he's the only one that rehearsed with me, but that's how it was in Slayer too, because Paul's close. I still lived in SoCal. Or, yeah, I still live in SoCal. So, um, you know, if we're tight, everyone's tight. But now with this band, um, you know, it's, it's a little further. Kyle's in Atlanta. Um, the other three guys in the Bay Area. I'm in New York now. So, um, you know, I rely on them to know their stuff. And we do rehearse when necessary just to make sure we're tight and everybody's, you know, playing the right transitions and stuff like that. But we don't got to we rehearse maybe two, three days before going out. Are you going to have rehearsals before the Slayer reunion dates? Oh, yeah. How yeah. long do you think that'll be? Like a week, um, a it's, month? It's, no, it's like, I think it's, I saw the email today, I think it's six, seven days. But full stage rehearsal. Everything. Oh, wow. Because we haven't played in five years. Are you going to set that up early at one of the festivals? Or are you going to set it up in a venue somewhere? It's, it's, a, it's a private facility yeah. I don't know much about it it's in Nowheresville Pennsylvania mm-hmm. and I'm going to be fucking stranded for a week <laughs> in Pennsylvania but we'll be burning shit every day so I'll, I'll be excited for a little bit because you want to make sure you don't miss the pyro cues after all these years yeah and you know, there'll be different ones um, there's some things you've seen before things you haven't seen before it's definitely the biggest Slayer show that I've ever seen on paper <laughs> oh, okay I was going to say because they're the retirement tour was pretty big. Yeah, yeah, I liked it. This is this is still bigger, but I mean, we're head we're you know headlining big ass festivals, so we really got to show up. How do you choose a set list for that? I think we I think I've already got it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's tough. I I worked on it like I, I probably made like three or four different ones before I landed on the one that I sent to everybody. Is it something where you're? giving everybody what they want but trying to have a couple surprises that's fair yeah yeah there's definitely a few songs I still have to learn so I haven't played them in a while and um how about set lists for a Carrie King band how do you guys put those together because I know you always want to include some Slayer songs but you've got the new album and how do you choose between the babies the set we're playing on this run is I mean, I love it because we open, you know, with the opener um, and then just kind of steps back and revamps up all the way to the end. It's really cool, this set. Um, But there's stuff off the new album. I just couldn't fit it in. We only got 40 minutes and we're only playing two Slayer songs. So it's not like I'm overloading on Slayer, but um, like we're, we're not playing Crucifixation. The other guys... Everybody wants to play Two Fists. I just couldn't find any place to put it, you know, that one. Um, what else are we? We're not doing Tension, which is a killer indoor song. Um, yeah, we're, all, we're doing... Wait, why is it better indoors? I would never play Tension outdoors. It's too moody. Oh. And by saying outdoors, I mean in the daylight. Okay. If we are outdoors in the evening, absolutely. But it's just got to, that's got to have a mood. You know, okay. kind of like Stillness from the last album. Um, but yeah, but we're playing seven of my songs and only two Slayer songs, so you know it's just a little, a little dash of Slayer to please the old fans, you know, and and because he got to. I and I, I squeezed in as many songs as I could. We're playing nine songs in forty minutes. We're just smashing them in there. So not a lot of stage powder from Mark. He has one, two, one, two, three. Yeah, I think he has three spots where he talks, and he he's a. He's a monster with the crowd. So are you just going to lock in a set list uh, every run and work with it? Or is there going to be like a, that's usually, fuck it, let's add a song or change out a song tonight? That's usually what we do. But when we're going to do headlines next year, we talked about learning like five or six covers. 
in like interchanging those like it would have one spot every night so whatever song we're playing that night and then you change it be in the same spot just different song you know and covers like Dio Priest Motorhead or covers like Slayer covers or oh no I wouldn't call Slayer covers I wrote yeah. those well fair enough and when I put them in my set I I make sure I had a part of it so you won't see us doing Angel of Death or War Ensemble or South of Heaven for a while because I want I want the people that groan about stuff like that to say oh he's doing his own songs that's cool I've got nothing to complain about that but will I ever play Angel of Death of course I'll play Angel of Death I'm just I want to get over the hump in you know maybe 2026 or something just pull a couple songs out like that but you know I wanted to rely on my stuff you said 2026 and it's still 24 I'm not committing to playing Jeff's songs in 25. So I don't know. I, okay. don't, I don't want to hear about it, you know. Are there some great songs? Fucking absolutely, but I don't want to hear about it. So if that means going through 2025, I don't do any of his songs yet, so be it. You know, this is my band. has got my name on it, so I want to live up to what people expect. Whatever happened to the snakes? Gave them to the guy that uh, ran the business. You just were like, bye guys. Well, I'm certainly wasn't going to move that to the East no, Coast. There's no way you're taking it to New York. <laughs> I just didn't know if you were going to still have like something on the West Coast mm -hmm. or any of that. No? No. I gave them to the dude that took care of them for me for all those years. Nice. Uh, I think that not just you, I think most of your band is not super personal or active on social media. Do you think that's a coincidence? I mean, all of you seem to have something, some kind of presence, because it's kind of required, because you're in a band, but I don't see, except for Phil, I don't see the rest of them posting like, hey, here we are doing this, and here's my favorite food, or whatever. Do you think that's kind of coincidence, or do you think that makes sense, because you guys all have a lot in common and get along really well, that it would just naturally be something that just wouldn't be of interest? I think it's coincidence and it makes sense because when these things first started coming and of course I have a, a, a presence through my uh, record label they run it um, but I remember when it first spieled to me and the guy says yeah you know you can you can use this app to tell people you know where you're at any time of day I'm like why would I want that why would I want anybody to know where I am it's gonna turn into a fucking autograph session you know, and I'm all about doing autographs, but I mean, not all day, every day, you know, and that's, that seemed like, who cares if I'm at blah, blah, blah restaurant? Who cares if I'm at this fucking theater doing whatever? Um, I just, and I still don't see it, you know, for some people, they live by it, you know, but it's not, not my cup of tea. So, on the autograph tip, um, are there going to be meet and greets in the future as an option for the band? When it makes sense, probably, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know. I don't know if they'll do it immediately when we start headlining. Um, I'm not against it. I know it's it's big with the fans, and you know we did on the last Slayer run, and you know people were super stoked about it. I mean, I remember you guys used to do record store in stores, mm -hmm. and we had. Are there lines. any record stores anymore? <laughs> there are. Well, that's I'm a big proponent of record store day, and that's when you kind of when all the record stores kind of get their day in the spotlight two days a year and I think it would be super cool if you guys did like a record store day release in an in-store just a total throwback yeah if it made sense I'm, I'm all about that I remember you guys did the um, Tower Records in San Francisco and there was a line for blocks and we were there all night and I was there with KSJO at the time and we had the van out front and somebody stole that van. <laughs> <laughs> I was not expecting that story to go there. Yeah. And I was like, well, I'm glad I wasn't the one in charge of those keys. But yeah, it was, uh, it's just things that used to be cool that we just don't have anymore. And I think that the fan meet and greet is the closest thing people can get to that yeah. sort of thing. Yeah, I get it. I'm not against it. I just don't want to be like, I don't want to seem weird, you know, I'd like us to be a little bit more established, probably. But, you know, if it made sense on the next run, so be it. But you guys are previously established, right? I mean, yeah. you're kind of showing up here with a... I want to make the right steps. Okay. And I know that you had a lot of time to think about those steps 
in the pandemic. And I love that you went with what is essentially an independent label. Mm -hmm. Right? And But my guy from Nuclear Blast, too. Yeah. But started his own label, right? Yep. So now it's it's basically an indie, right? I guess. I think that's how that goes. Maybe I'm wrong. Sorry, Gerardo. Um, shit, I think that's everything I had. Holy crap, we just blew right through them all. Just watching the lights. <laughs> are you um, are you sick and tired of doing interviews? Because there's been so many of them. I haven't been bombarded. Yeah. Well, I heard about this weeks ago, and I'm like, well, make that happen. Because I knew you were you were thank looking you, for it for quite a while. So yeah. like in person, fuck yeah, I'll do that to forum. Well, that's what I thought would make it cool, you know? Because at first I was like, oh shit, he's. I want to try and get in ahead of the the big radio days, you know, where you got to sit there and everybody gets 15 minutes and it just, it feels like you say the same thing over and over and it's not your fault because everybody, people are asking the same questions. Like, I know what your favorite bands are already. Judas Priest, Black Sabbath, Deep Purple, you know, Iron Maiden. It's, <laughs> I know how the band name came about. I know, you know, we, we, like we got all that stuff. So I was like, all right. Um, and then once we, you guys came back from Europe, you kind of did like another round and I was like, okay. And everybody saw a lot of the stuff that happened in Europe. So I was going to say like tour stories, like did anything happen? Like you met Keanu Reeves. That was kind of cool. Yeah, that was cool. And I'll tell you, it was fun. And I, I didn't want it to be weird, you know, cause he's a superstar really. Um, so I wanted to, you know, have an introduction and say, Hey man, as I told him, I said, my wife would chop my fucking head off if I didn't reach out and meet fucking John Wick, you know. And in person, he's way more Bill and Ted than John Wick. <laughs> really? Way more. <laughs> like, I was surprised. <laughs> wow. All right. Anything else happen on tour while you guys were out? Anything surprise you? Nothing surprises me anymore. <laughs> Fair. Jesus. I was pretty surprised by the charter plane we took that looked more like a crop duster than anything I should put a guitar on. Um, and we took that that rickety old thing twice. So, that was kind of a surprise. What country was that? I don't remember. Yeah. Three. We took it twice. Just I know one was coming in or going out of Hellfest just because it was tough to get to. One was going into Donington for download. Um, I'd have to look back at my pictures and see. I took a picture of that sketchy fucking thing. <laughs> Just in case. You're like, if I go down, they're finding this. Yeah. That's what I was in. I told you. <laughs> Did, um... Oh, God, I lost my train of thought again. This happens to me sometimes now. Um, I got the brain fog. And it's gone. Oh! How long did it take you to get your touring legs back on? Because you were home for four years so touring wasn't that wasn't weird that no. was that was the part if anything that was the part like riding a bike it was just figuring out the stage and and you know where i'm supposed to be doing what when um yeah that was the part and you know making sure getting the parts right taking time out to entertain because i don't just stand there and play guitar i like to entertain so just figuring out all the ins and outs of being on stage was the the tough part Somebody told me you were a WWE fan. Like 25 years ago. Okay. Like That's when Stone fun. Cold and The Rock came out and Undertaker and Triple H, you know, when it was a lot more real and in your face than it is now. Now it's nothing against it, but it was more real, even though it was fake, if you understand what I'm saying. Like, it's now it's obviously fake, and these people are like cartoon comic book characters, you know. They're not like Stone Cold who would come out and just start fights with the owner. <laughs> that was that was my favorite. So it's kind of like we can blame Marvel for making it more plastic. Marvel and reality TV mm -hmm. for making it complicated storylines that go nowhere. Yeah, I, I put one on once a month, maybe. Do you have a favorite wrestler? I couldn't even tell you who's popular right now. Who's your favorite classic? My favorite what? Classic wrestler. Stone Cold. All right. Attitude man. I used to wear his shirts on stage. You did. The one where he's just going. <laughs> that sounds like it should be your merch now. Yeah. That should be a Carrie King t-shirt. I start flipping off the fucking photographers. Why not? How is merch? I what do you guys got out there? 
um, two or three shirts, mm -hmm. cool hat, cool bandana. But I mean, we're third on the bill, so it's not like we're gonna have twenty shirts of this. And but next year, next year, you know. But we're we're not doing big rooms, so I mean, mm -hmm. it might expand to maybe four shirts, a long sleeve, maybe a hoodie, you know, depending on the time of year and where we're at. Bitchin'. <laughs>